Okay, the, the next presenter we have is, is, is Hamish Beliski. So now, I'll give you a little bit of a spiel about him. Hamish, Amy, and their three children farm in a joint venture of 300 hectares in South Otago between Balclutha and Clinton. It is their fifth year into the venture. Their land consists of gentle rolling to steeper gullies and bound by the Pomahaka River. They have, sorry, this is, this is what, I've turned into my dad. <laughs> they run an integrated sheep, beef and arable operation for the initial years but are heading down the path of using regenerative farming principles and have decided to run 2,300 breeding sheep, 200 trading cattle and no more cropping. Their vision is to reach the potential of the land, ecosystems, well-being and bank balance. Hamish. set this all up for me four years ago, May 2016, was this really annoying woman who came over from Australia. And she started to challenge my paradigm and I didn't like it. And I spent all day uh, arguing with her and implying that she didn't know what she was talking about. And, and that lady was Dr. Christine Jones. <laughs> Yeah, she flipped my world upside down, and my wife Amy was uh, onto this well before I was, but who listens to their wives? <laughs> <laughs> so I spent the next winter um, travelling the world on YouTube, and I just researched and researched what I could to find out how we can um, improve our ecosystems, our people, and our profits with using no inputs, or very, very little inputs. And, and like, how do you do that? And so, it's, it's almost the holy grail, is can I grow more feed? Because if I don't want to winter crop, because winter cropping, the way we're doing it, is one of the most damaging practices to our environment, in, in the south, probably is actually most of this country, um, then I need to grow more feed to be able to get through that winter on just on pasture only. So those are the questions that we headed into. And in the meantime, we've been transi transitioning. So just a few, um, <coughs> I now, after you know, understanding a lot more, I now see myself as a landscape manager, and after last night, I'm actually a foodscape manager, <laughs> um, for those that listen to that talk. And, then, <laughs> and I'm also an, an energy farmer. And once I started getting that, and understanding that our farm is one big solar panel, it, things started to click. And we happened to run sheep and beef. That was the outcome. And we've tried cropping, etc. So Amy and I are in an equity partnership of 300 hectares, rolling country in, in South Otago. So I've said this, our aim is to build the energy, water and nutrient cycles while producing thriving people, animals and bank balance. Our land is one big solar panel and our livestock are energy harvesters that turn energy from photosynthesis to high quality nutrient dense food while fertilizing and building the soil carbon sponge at the same time. Yeah. In six years, we've gone from using 50,000 litres of diesel to 5,000 litres and dropping. That was when we started um, cropping. And, I, and this is not the cropping the way that Nigel and Simon do it. This is the cropping that the way everybody in my area does it. If you don't do it that way, you're a fool. In year one, we applied 125 tonnes of fertiliser down to 2.5 tonnes this year. No fertiliser for the past three years except on diverse winter crops. And our soil and herbage tests are either level or improving. We have lifted carrying capacity from 2,600 stock units to now 3,500 stock units, seven tonne growing in the first year we, we were there, and uh, around 11 tonne is look as though what will grow this year. 
is these are my questions. Well, these are the questions people ask me. Are we sustainable without external non-renewable fertilizer? Can we still be performing at this level in three to five times? And I cannot answer them. Ask me in five years' time. Sustainability. This is the, the um, definition that I got. Is the ability the, our resources, the ability to be maintained at a steady level without exhausting our natural resources or causing severe ecological damage? Well, that just sums it up really well. So our whole world, our whole globe, is not sustainable. So let's start taking the word sustainable out of our sentences and our visions and our mission statements and actually get real with us as we're not sustainable. We still rely on fossil fuels and it's probably about it at the moment to keep us going. But we're getting there, we're working in the right direction. Resources are not the problem, the way we manage them is. Make that a very clear distinction. Fossil fuels are wonderful. Let's use way less so we can carry on building stuff that we need to be efficient in this world. Because once we run out of those, then we're really in trouble. Because then you can't build your electric car, you know? When you start getting behind it all, it's not quite as rosy as what we all think. Um, that's just a clear picture that I love. And it just sums up so much. Um, this is what I was doing. And this is what I thought was fine. This is, this was, I just thought was normal, man. This is what you do. And you didn't question it. So I'm, there's a sheep, not cattle. I'm looking at sheep here. This is only, this is just this winter and last winter, okay? So it's not like, uh, from all we've heard, are we actually... Uh, and, and I can take photos driving on Highway 1 even this winter. You can see it already happening. This is November and a, and a thunderstorm. But like, when you have bare soil, you are in trouble. You are going to damage the ecosystem no matter what mitigation techniques you try and come up with. Apparently, for, if you stop 96% of the sediment getting into the waterways, the last 4% of the fines do the most damage. This is a problem farm. Now they're putting up um, weed nets to capture the um, sediment. Cool. Uh, and I just wanted to add this in too. This is a vegetable farm. So the whole plant-based versus um, animal-based argument, just stop it and let's actually understand that it's our management of whatever land we have is the issue, not what we're eating. And that's the outcome, Pohanka River. That's in November, that's not even winter cropping. And that's what I started doing. Now, you start doing that for 15 hours a day, and you get a really sore neck, and you start to ask, why am I doing this? And that's thankfully when Christine Jones came along, and it all started to align with um, how I was starting to think. Oh my goodness, they were all meant to be hidden. So anyway, that is, um, that's our new pastures now. So oh, I'm very grateful that I heard that from Christine Jones earlier because we've, we've developed 80% of our farm in the last five years into new pastures. That was our strategy when we started and we're six years into it. So about 90% now is probably in diverse pasture species. I'm just so thankful I didn't cover the whole thing in ryegrass clover. And that's part of uh, one of our winter crops, but this is not the focus. Uh, I, I started getting very focused on the diverse cover crops, etc., and now I realise it still takes energy and tractors and stuff to get these in the ground. So now our next part of the journey is working out how do we grow more grass so that we don't even need any crops, so that the whole operation is diverse pastures. And so when I got there. A lot of the, um, our farm had, the tops grew really well and the sides were poor. And so when I first got there, I doubled the fert rate on the sides and halved it on the top. And it made no difference. <laughs> Until I started learning about some of these grazing techniques. And if you park your animals on the sides at night, that 70% of the dung and urine is transferred at night. And 
we started to transform our farm by just these simple techniques. Time, my time, but no fertilizer trucks. And that's what it looks like. And I'll tell you what, it is transforming the farm. Now, let's stop this. Pause. We now have all our stock in two mobs on the farm. And I just wanted to take a video of this. Um, there's a few key principles here that we observe before we move the stock. We want to move these stock. They're going into feed like this after 30 days. This is the feed. But when we shift them, they are full. And so they are content and growing at their maximum. So maximum animal performance. When people tell you about regenerative grazing, we uh, you know, we use up more methane because we grow our animals slower and we're worse for the environment, just drop those my head in. Regenerative grazing like this is about vegetative growth. Absolutely key. But it's taller and it's fully recovered. And I'll get more into that soon. But the animals are full and that is key. If there's a gut score up in here, and if that's hollow, you're too late. That, that are some of the um, indicators of, of when we start to move. So, yep, go. Oh, yep. <laughs> Keep going. So my lambs, my ewe hoggets, my finishing lambs, and all my cattle are in this mob. Um, calves, yearlings, two-year-olds. Um, I only need two wires now. I could probably just about get away with one, but they just get so well trained to it. And so this is what they're going into. The, the clover is mind-blowing. I've never experienced this in my life. I mean, yes, we've had some great rainfall, don't get me wrong. But after 30 days to come back after this with no fertilizer, was just way beyond my expectations. Now what I'm showing you here is what we're leaving behind and this is absolutely crucial because there is no bare soil showing after grazing. This just leaves a thick mat of laid down litter and at 20 degrees under that, the soil is 20 degrees under that um, in a, on a hot day. Whenever we get huge amounts of rainfall, like we did the other day, 200 millimeters of rain, I reckon we utilized, used maybe 150 or 60, went in, and we started getting tiles running. It just was not running off at all like I expected, expected to be. As soon as raindrops hit, litter, it spreads out and slows down. When it's bare soil, bang, erosion. Now, where this is different to, everyone says um, dairy farmers are already at regenerative grazing. They are not. When you go in with a lack of density, they will eat it from, say, 3,000 to 1,500, and there's bare soil when you look down on top of it. There's a huge difference. The absolute key to this operation is the density of animals within the mob. The number of animals per hectare at one time. And we're shifting these twice a day. Through the spring, we're shifting four times a day, our ewes and lambs that are in one big mob. So we've got up to 950 ewes with 1,650 lambs in one mob, four times a day. It does get exhausting sometimes. <laughs> and this is what re the result after using a deferred paddock, so I take paddocks out of the rotation when it starts to beat me, is you come back to the one that's recovered first. When it's recovered, come back to it and leave those out. Because that is what it looks like. Now, every time I see that, I think, oh, I haven't eaten enough. It's going to, um, I'm going to lose quality. And then 30 days time, it looks like that. 
It just blows me away. Again, just another example of, of what we're going into. And there's another picture of that same mob um, on another part of the farm. And I'll tell you what, once you get into this, it's really hard someone to get your head around the whole planning of it and getting all the mobs in the right place. But once you get into it, you get in the rhythm. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's almost like, I can't describe it, like a river going through your farm, or Donimo's, just laying down litter, feeding fat stock, and it just bouncing up behind them. Because the other thing you've got to remember about this, what I've left behind, what's it doing? It's still pumping carbon through photosynthesis. Because we've got huge leaf area. It's what Andre Voissan calls the blaze of growth. Does everyone know about the blaze of growth? Has everyone read his book? Thank you, Shimon Griffin, who got me onto that because it's enlightening. So whenever you go away from that, it's not going through a lag phase of trying to recover. It just, boom, it's straight into growing at its near and potential. That, so that paddock there, that's them there. When I come out of it, that's what it looked like. And you just, please understand that I still top. I still top. If I if it, if it does get too unruly on me, I'll come in when it's a, a wet period and I'll top. If you don't want to top, you just have to increase your density so you trample more. It just gets too much sometimes to be shifting four times a day through this period. You know, only, we only just made the plane. <laughs> Trying to get all this sorted so that my neighbour can shift them easy. I'm going down to once a day when we're gone. And, and this is just an example of these, the, the flat tips, not recovered, where it gets tippy, recovered. That's basically what I look at. So if the paddock's full of flat tips, it's not recovered. And if you're going back round and they're flat tips and you eat it, you start diminishing your effect. You're overstocked. This is deferred grazing. So the lambs go on that, they do not like it and they do not do well on it. So what I do is I put the ewes in there at density and I'll ship them 1,600 ewes, one hectare per day. And they will just leave it trampled. And then in 30, 35 days, it'll look like those paddocks before. It is mind blowing. It is so exciting. The, that is just pumping fertility back into our system for nothing. Can I carry on doing this in five years, or three years, or 10 years, or 20? I do not know. What I've seen from around the world, absolutely you can. We have taken out $80,000 from our budget in the last year. Silage, hay, gone. Fertilizer budget, gone. Seed contracting, going. Understand though, we've spent a lot of money getting to this point. So it's not all, you know, you can either do this in five years or 20 years. This is the way we've chosen to do it, and I don't, do not regret it. But you can certainly still get amazing results by taking a longer period of time, if not even doing any regress. And that, to me, is a picture that sums up what we're trying to do. If you have roots like this, nutrients struggle to get below that. Nitrates, what problem? If you have roots like this, nitrates, once they get below that, gone. Nutrients gone. And what is the Canterbury Plains full of? Irrigated ryegrass. So it's always up at the water at the top. And then they say plantain is going to be the answer. Plantain lasts for about two years and then it's gone. Then what are you going to do? Or <coughs> more of. Can you see the whole mentality of our whole system? And now they're even saying, they're in dead saying, fodder beats the answer because it lowers your nitrates. <laughs> oh no. As if this is the answers that are coming out at the moment, then I don't hold much hope for the environmental improvement of our land. 
So just a quick um, on our lambs growing, 320 grams per day to weaning, we can keep improving that, and 250 grams a day post weaning. That is with our lambs getting one drench at weaning. I was astounded at how well they've done. I drenched them, so 80% of our lambs are gone by end of February, and at about 17.8 kilos, uh, and I did drench them before uh, a couple of weeks ago because I went through some overly recovered pasture and they didn't do as well. They didn't like it. So I learned that, you know, they just don't go too far above it. If, if you do, just put the ewes through there. So I put the ewes through after that and then got it all trampled down, tidied up, and away we go again. Oh, just as an aside, dung beetles. So we've released three or four lots of dung beetles and they will, um, after seven or eight years, 90% of the dung is buried at root level after 48 hours. There goes your E. coli problems off the top and your fly problems in the poo. I mean, what is there not to like about that? I, I mean, one of the, every council should be just <laughs> drumming them out like they did clover root weevil. <laughs> so, yeah, I won't go too much into this because I've actually explained it as I've gone. So, uh, uh, we go from a 20 day rotation in the spring because it's growing that flat out. Now we're at a 30 day round because we've had rain. If we got dry, we'd be back to a 50 day round. In the winter, we're to a 100 day round because that's how long it takes for our plants to recover in the winter. And we do actually give in the winter a good tidy up, a good grazing, so it starts to reset the clover and reset for the spring. Because when you hit a plant hard in a non-growing season, no major effect. Um, so the key things is density and time. So a short amount of time in one small area shifted often. That's what it comes down to. Because when those animals go in there, they just into it without getting too fussy. So if you saw all those paddocks where I left behind, just about every leaf has been grazed. It astounds me at how well this is working. That's why I'm very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> it is an absolute solution. Absolute solution. Um, and like I say, we'll top if it, if I, if it beats me. Because um, if you don't graze all your plants evenly, you then have the amount of area that's effectively photosynthesizing and pumping carbon. I hope this, I mean, this took me two years to understand, so I'm trying to get it out in 15 minutes. Um, yeah, so when plant shed exceeds demand, take paddocks out on the rotation. At the moment, my ewes follow my lambs, and I, I realized the other day I should have um, weathered my lambs so that um, I can put the whole mob in one three and a half thousand stock units into one. When we get dry, that is a massive trump card. And you just have, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. Just one mob, so easy. Um, uh, it is no longer about utilization, okay. but building capacity to grow and fertilize by laying down plant litter and spreading dung and urine evenly over the whole farm. I will not fear wasting grass. That's by Jim Garish. And he tells us to say that over and over and over until we get it. And I now get it. And I can only say this to you now after this summer's experience. Up until now, I'm like, mm, I love the idea. I just don't know if it's going to work. It is working so well. I'm so pleased to be here. Important differential. The improvements are based on a process management and system changes not fertilizer biological products. So when people attack regenerative agriculture and say we're going to we use compost and bloom juice and stuff, I'm like, that is just the beautiful strategy to get everybody else put off regenerative agriculture. Understand that. Understand that they are skilled at these techniques. So I just want to get across to you that the management is absolutely fundamentally key. And that is the vision that sums up where we want to head in the future. We've got a chestnut forest that we did not plant, but I'm so grateful that the previous owners did. Pine trees as part of it for a 
hair strop, and then a beautifully braised mob of sheep and beef or whatever you would like. And I can't see anything better than improving our ecosystems, our environment, and our profitability. Thank you.